Well, there's been much uh, talk in the so-called alternative science movement about ether these days, and there has been for a long time. It actually goes back to um, the time of Descartes. I, uh, I was first exposed to the ether theory when I was uh, studying the WASPI, which is a very esoteric piece of literature. And uh, the Book of Cosmogony and Prophecy is all about vortices in the ether. Um, I wanted to show you just how wrong that all is. In Russellian science, we learned that these are the inert gases. These four inert gas rings are basically responsible for creating all of the elements. The elements, here's the Walter Russell's spiral periodical table, the elements are all created by these inert gases, which are the zeros on this line here. And each octave has an inert gas that creates all the elements, where there's different pressure conditions of female lights uh, as opposed to the, fail, the male lights here. And these create ring systems. These elements are ring systems that are on this side, and this is a spherical system. And the same process is repeated for every octave, all the way up and all the way down. What science doesn't understand is that there are these elements. Here's hydrogen, which is at the amplitude wave of the third octave. That means that there's these two and a half, three and a half octaves right here that are full of space gases, which um, Walter Russell has labeled right here. They're, they're hard to read, I know. But just for the point, uh, they are nebulous gases. These are just the exact opposite of the ether theory. The ether theory uh, postulates that there are extremely small indivisible particles, which is the universal substrate, and tensions, electrical tensions within that uh, create the illusions of, of matter in, um, in space. So the, this is the archaic idea of the ether. There are also some very other strange, bizarre um, versions of the ether by people like uh, John Keeley, for instance, who did a lot of damage to the study of, um, of science because he was ter it turned out he was a fraud. So all of the stuff that he talks about in various types of ether is, is fraudulent. He's, uh, anybody can look him up, just go ahead and, and uh, do some research on You'll find out that they found out he was cheating on these uh, free energy uh, devices he claimed he was creating. He had a big pressurized cylinder buried below his house with little tubes running to the machine. So. He was a scam artist, so his, his theory of, um, of ether is, is easily debunkable because he turned out to be a fraud. So what we have here is these upper three octaves are, they, these gases fill all of space. So as you go up the periodical table, although this gets bigger and bigger, I think it's really, we have to make these, these waves larger and larger, which is exactly the reverse of what's happening because what's happening is these octaves up here are getting more and more and more dense. They're getting tinier. The inert gas rings are smaller and smaller and smaller as you go up. And therefore, you also, in these upper, from the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth octaves, you have a lot of isotopes. These are all isotopes here. These would be red side male isotopes. These would be female isotopes, female isotopes, male isotopes, female isotopes, male isotopes. So, They've had to expand this chart and make everything appear as it's getting bigger just to fit all these names in. When in reality, it's just the exact opposite of this because what happens is as you go up into these above, these gases above hydrogen, these are extremely nebulous. The wave fields of these are extremely large in comparison. And I want to show you how that works. You see the inert gas rings. They are on the six faces of the cube, as well as the three interior uh, inertial planes of the cube. So, what happens is, on a galaxy, you have massive rings. You can see these rings right here are extremely large, and this is showing what these would be like in order to create a galaxy. These are the inert gas rings for the level of the size of something that's scalable, uh, the size of a galaxy. I mean, it's just massive. So uh, the same exact process is going on in the elements. These elements up here that we can perceive and we call mass and gases and things that were, they're perceivable to us are all created by the same exact process, which is these twin opposing vortices and how they meet and create either 
spherical bodies at the, the collision of the, the amplitude of the wave, or they create ring systems with one, two, or three rings, this side being male dominant, and this side being female dominant, these are ring systems, and here we have the spherical body. So this ex same exact process is going on to create galaxies as well as solar systems. And the thing that's really, the, the issue here is that the, the inert gas rings are massive. Okay, so if you're in a galaxy, you're just a little tiny star here somewhere, and you're on a planet, a little star, how could you possibly perceive the crest of one wave on a galaxy, at the level of a galaxy? It's impossible, we can't even perceive it. That's why these gases are imperceptible to us. But space is not filled with indivisible ether particles. It's filled with extremely nebulous gases, which once again is the exact opposite of the ether theory. So uh, I had to bring this up because I'm seeing a lot of uh, information a lot of people, I think, with good hearts and good minds are actually trying to solve the free energy um, crisis. Um, and what, what we've got is a bunch of people believing in archaic ideas like ether just because Schauberger, Tesla, Maxwell, and people like this a hundred or more years ago believed in an ether. The ether was created to try to explain how light traveled through space. Well, Walter Russell's explained to us, light does not travel through space light repeats itself from wave field to wave field of space. Now imagine the size of the wave fields that have inert gas rings that are big enough to create a galaxy. They're huge, they're massive. So here's another thing to think about. If these, these massive wave fields can produce a galaxy like this, you have to understand this galaxy is just a small dot in the middle of a cubic wave field. That means these wave fields are massive. The instantaneous transmission of that light on, at the level of this wave field, it goes so far beyond the, the, the so-called velocity of light we're used to measuring here on Earth that it, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, we're just a little spot, you know, a little, little globe here by one of these stars, and yet this entire system is nothing but a little tiny dot in the middle of a massive wave field of space, which is filled with the space gases. It's not filled with ether, it's filled with the space gases. So I hope this will help people understand that there's no such thing as an ether. I mean, the, the, the uh, indivisible ether particles you know, theorized by the 19th century era, uh, ether theorists have been debunked. The Michelson-Morley experiment proved there was no, um, there was no static or stationary ether. It didn't prove there wasn't a dynamic one, but we really don't need to go there anyway because we just need to think about this a little bit. What is science so infamous for? They're infamous for materialistic reductionism, believing somehow you can go and find a particle or some scrap of reality and then, you know, give it all the credit for reality. Like, like the pig's bozo particle, for instance, that these crackpots at the Hadron Collider uh, think they're goofing around with. There's no such thing as a Higgs boso particle or Pig's boso, whatever it's called. Uh, that doesn't exist because the creator does not exist as a material creation. The, the, the creator exists in eternity in the stillness of the magnetic still light, which is not part of this universe. It, it centers and bounds all electrical motions in this universe, but it is not a part of this universe. It is the cause of this universe. The Creator's magnetic light cre uh, kingdom is the cause of everything. So these are things to keep in mind when studying this. There is no longer a need to, to uh, use ether as a crutch, like Tesla, Schauberger's, and others did, because light doesn't travel, first of all, and it repeats itself from wave field to wave field of space. And as I just explained, think about space on the size of a galaxy. The distances are massive, and think about the instant, instantaneous transmission of light within this wave field that's creating this galaxy, and how it changes and, and uh, repeats itself in the neighboring galactic wave fields. So here we have an explanation which requires no ether at all, and it makes a lot more sense. And uh, it was produced by Walter Russell, who was a polymath. 
he wasn't uh, one of these theorists guessing at things. He was working with divine illumination, which comes directly from the Creator. So, anyways, this is a far superior system of uh, cosmology. I encourage everyone to study Rasselian science, and I encourage everyone in the, the alternative energy field to, to you know, give, give up your pacifier. You can throw away your ether now. Uh, the crutch is no longer required to explain the foundational motions of light. So, anyways, I hope this helps everyone. Uh, much love to y'all, and talk to y'all soon.